I am delivering these remarks uh, from San Diego, where I live currently. Um, during the pandemic, I was not on the East Coast, so I, I stayed home. So in light of this, I wanted to acknowledge that where I live um, in the housing that's provided to me here is on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. And you know, today the Kumeyaay people are continuing to maintain political sovereignty and their cultural traditions as important members of the San Diego community. So I wanted to thank them in particular for their stewardship of the land and, and contributions to the region uh, before I get started. Okay, so uh, this talk today might be a bit ambitious with um, the ground that I would like to cover, but I hope that whatever we don't get to in the main part of the presentation, I'm happy to elaborate on uh, in the Q&A. But the talk is emerging out of a larger project that I have examining uh, the underlying normative framework and developing uh, an account of justice for climate displacement. And so though my talk today is the right to a livable locality, I'm examining climate displacement within the context of uh, the territorial state system. And uh, before we get started and talking about the structure of uh, the talk today, I just wanted to draw brief attention to the photograph that I have here um, on the first slide. Uh, this is the work by Dawit Petros, who was born in Eritrea and currently lives in New York City, uh, but has actually lived in Montreal. I wasn't sure if people might be familiar um, with his work, but his work was brought to my attention um, by Maza Mengiste, a novelist that we recently had um, at a panel that we organized uh, at Harvard um, at the Mahindra Center where I'm at on migration. And um, she is a friend and admirer of his work. And I thought it was a very telling image. And if you have the opportunity to look up the collection, uh, Stranger's Notebook, where this is from, um, I encourage you to do so. It's a conceptual multimedia series that really questions the relationship of the self to place, but is examined under the context of present day migration in Africa. So there's a lot of these images where um, it's a mirror instead of the place of where someone's face might be reflecting, reflecting the landscape and things like like that. Um, and some of the inspiration for the aesthetics and politics for that exhibit uh, is drawn from um, some of Camus' work from The Stranger and so some explorations of philosophical conception of outsiderness or otherness. Uh, so I thought I'd just um, bring that to everyone's attention and, and uh, so you can check it out. In any case, um, how I'm going to proceed with the clock, uh, the, the talk today is to first try to contextualize for everyone the problems and challenges associated with climate change displacement, uh, predominantly a conceptual challenges that emerge, legal challenges, and then this normative gap, which I aim to fill. And then I'll move relatively quickly through uh, the underlying normative framework that I've developed uh, for addressing um, questions about what is owed in the context of climate displacement. Um, but the main body that I wanna focus on in the work today is the way that I build out this grounding right for that normative framework, namely the right to a livable locality. So I assume this normative framework in the current paper that this talk is based out of, but I do have another publication that defends that normative framework fully. So I'm happy to expand on that, especially when we have questions. And then if we have some time towards the end of the talk, I do wanna have some forward looking gestures towards certain kinds of implications for law and policy that this normative framework uh, can provide. And um, recently in the news, especially here in the United States, some things have come up in that context. So I, I hope to bring that to everybody's attention. All right, so to get started, uh, to provide some context for climate change and displacement, uh, the problem is very complex. So I'm not even sure I'll be able to do justice to all the complexity here, but I did wanna bring up some relevant considerations, especially for those of us that are interested in developing a normative framework. Um, so in particular, as the impacts of anthropogenic climate change continue to be experienced around the world, experts have been observing and predicting that climate change is and is going to continue to contribute to the movement of people. And that movement is both within and beyond uh, state borders, at least the projections right, are looking at both internal and external migration. Uh, it's difficult to overstate the problem uh, in terms of the legal, social, political, and moral challenges that uh, we face in this context. Um, but I do want to bring attention to some terminology and some distinctions that might help us to understand that complexity. So first and foremost, when we say that movement is impacted by climate change, uh, those of us that are working on that in the literature understand those impacts uh, in two categories. 
namely the idea of rapid or quick onset events that are prompted by climate change and then slower onset events. And I'll speak a little bit to the, the intersection of these with regards to movement. So rapid and quick onset events are you know, extreme weather events, disasters. And since 2017, we've seen that more people have actually been displaced, at least internally, by such disasters. So the comparison between political conflict and this kind of displacement is about 61% through disaster and 39, you know, environmental disaster and 39% to political distribution or um, disruptions. And the severity and frequency of storms and extreme weather events has tripled in the past 30 years. And so for immediate responses or immediate survival, many people might be displaced temporarily, but depending on the various contexts that they're arising from, that could amount to more permanent forms of displacement. So one thing to think of in terms of quick onset is usually it's kind of seen as an emergency in an immediacy framework, but also might have this sort of long-term implication. Uh, that brings me to a second set of climate impacts that are more long-term when you're thinking about how they relate to movement. So these are ongoing uh, climate related uh, impacts such as sea level rise, erosion, desertification, the salination of fresh water sources. So increasing salinity in coastal zones as sea level rises and encroaches on those coastal zones. And these kinds of um, uh, climate related impacts have already been contributing to displacement um, and migration and places are slowly becoming unlivable as a result of those. Uh, in By unlivable, I mean people not able to sustain certain kinds of livelihoods uh, within certain safe conditions, right, that they previously found themselves in. So this deterioration of habitability over time prompts consideration of movement but movement not in a failure sense of this sort of immediate need to leave like the quick onset events, but also understanding movement as possibly a form of adaptation. And I'm gonna speak a lot to this uh, dual understanding of movement today. Um, so the emergency might be unfolding over a longer time horizon. And therefore there's the opportunity to actually understand movement as a form of adaptation, which it is has in fact been <laughs> for the majority of human existence. Um, we have been you know, migrating, a, 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 you know, in response to, <clears throat> excuse me, certain environmental conditions. Um, but there are significant changes, both in the extreme conditions that we're finding ourselves in due to anthropogenic climate change, and also that such movement is going to be encountering state borders. And so that's starting to present the problem um, that climate change displacement is starting to pose. But I do want to stress that it's not merely a future concern. We're already seeing cases, we're already seeing cases on the legal um, kind of parameters of people applying for asylum claims. And we're also seeing uh, certain kinds of movement that may not be associated immediately with climate displacement, but seeing that there are some kinds of entanglements there. Um, so speaking of that, I do want to talk about sort of what you might hear in the popular kind of context with regards to climate displacement um, and sort of the narrative of the climate refugee versus some maybe um, more careful ways to understand the phenomena. So isolating climate change as the sole or direct cause of human movement is very complicated. And especially if you're trying to isolate that sole cause as the grounds for protection. So if you need to have some really clear causal story, that's gonna be very different, uh, uh, very difficult to do in the context of climate related movement. Um, that's because climate may represent certain kinds of um, exacerbations, accelerating already vulnerable conditions people find themselves in. But decisions to move are very complex to prove and are varied, right? Multiple factors, um, as well as the resources available to folks, allow for movement to even be um, relevant as far as a decision uh, for people to move away from impacted areas. So this actually relates to findings in just traditional refugee literature um, and the studies of climate related displacement, you know, echo that literature in that oftentimes too, the most vulnerable uh, to these conditions may not even have the choice to move, right? Due to certain kinds of economic limitations, health and skills. So to really only focus on climate displacement as external movement across borders, 
um, might limit the phenomena, but the way in which it traditionally gets uh, accounted for are by these huge numbers of projections of how many people are going to be moving and how many of those people are going to be moving across borders. And what that is starting to trigger are, at least in the sort of political sphere with when which this is being discussed, considerations of climate displacement as a sole concern with regards to security, national security threats. And so we do want to be careful with how we are talking about climate related movement um, so that we can understand the nuance and then prompt the um, appropriate kinds of responses to it. And so one thing to bring up in that context is a lot of movement is going to be internal at first, uh, and then depending on the certain pressures might prompt cross border movement. And that cross border movement, like I mentioned before, may not always take the form of flight like we tend to think in traditional conceptions of refugees. Uh, so we have to understand that kind of idea of, of possibly planned migration. Uh, and I mentioned the, the difficulties in prediction, uh, predicting the scale and scope. Uh, it's hard to find a quantifiable number. There's a lot of numbers that have been going around based on certain kinds of studies. And if you look at Jane McAdams work, um, she speaks a little bit to uh, which studies might be seen more or less reliable given these kinds of projections. Um, there are some alarmist approaches. She kind of puts some of these studies in the alarmist uh, camp, which have garnered most of the public attention. Um, but there is more careful research that shows that the numbers, at least, um, or in terms of predictions by 2050, could be that up to a billion people are impacted. So that doesn't necessarily mean a billion people are moving, let alone a billion people moving across borders but that depending on how we might be able to facilitate adaptation and resilience, that's the potential number, right? Um, that's been floating around in terms of communities um, that will be impacted. And so we do wanna make sure that in light of these kinds of complexities um, that we understand sort of what we're talking about when we're talking about the need for developing a normative um, approach to addressing the problem. And so I mentioned Jane McAdam, she's a professor of law and the director of um, the Calder Center for International Refugee Law at UNSW in Sydney. And she's argued uh, to try to move away from the sort of alarmative, alarmist uh, conceptions and to have a different kind of um, more complex understanding uh, between movement and its relationship to climate change. So she pushes an alternative conception and it's that alternative conception that I take up in my work and wanna see that the normative framework I give can, can ground. Um, and so she argues that we should be referencing people's adaptive capacities and their resilience so that we can understand movement in that more complex way instead of solely focusing on vulnerability. And what's problematic in this like sole vulnerability narrative is that it can divert attention away from the specific needs of impacted communities, just seeing them as folks that need to be rescued in a sort of homogeneous way. Um, like I mentioned, it can feed into these alarmist narratives that just drive national security responses, which if you're looking at the US-Mexico border, for example, those are practices of incarceration and policing that get utilized as responses to climate crisis and seem to be legitimized under this national security kind of threat, which is of course problematic. And uh, it can also be disempowering for communities themselves because you might be erasing the certain kind of knowledge or adaptive capacities community have or erase the fact uh, the, that they might've had certain kinds of capacities if there wasn't certain kinds of actions um, on behalf of the international state uh, community. And so one important thing is when we're looking to kind of move beyond a mere vulnerability narrative, we want to be able to centralize the decision-making authority of people that are impacted. Uh, and a problem, and this is kind of speaks to a larger problem, I think, in work on climate justice, is we want to resist uh, a way of framing it that prompts certain kinds of fatalism, right? Like the problem is too big, so we're not going to be able to have adequate adaptation policies and infrastructure. So I want to be able to resist uh, the tempting sort of fatalist approaches to leave this problem as one that should be addressed in an ad hoc way. Um, and in a specific way in which you can sort of uh, fall into this vulnerability narrative is to understand movement merely as failure, like I talked about. Um, however, if communities have resources for adaptation, there either might be less need for movement, or there's at least some sort of grounds for relief and rehabilitation that might prompt the ability for folks to return. 
And if there isn't the opportunity for people to return to where they've been displaced because of long-term onset effects, hopefully the idea is that we can ground certain kinds of um, migration with dignity as President Tong of Kiribati has referred to it on this idea of a managed migration um, in the face of these challenges. Okay. So uh, I do want to bring up that beyond these conceptual challenges, there are also legal challenges to doing something about climate uh, displacement. So the legal and policy interventions that shape our outcomes determine whether migration is a form of adaptation or whether it's a sign of failure. Um, but for the past 20 years or so, courts have been considering whether states can either deport or refuse entry for people who are at risk of climate related impacts. And the public discussion and narrative has really been about the climate refugee. Um, I resist using the label for the reasons I'm gonna outline here in the legal challenge and also because displaced people recently have been pushing back on being framed as climate refugees. And I can say a little bit more um, to those claims in the Q&A. Uh, but the idea is that most claims of protection uh, for someone who's displaced had been advanced on the grounds that they would be severely impacted if they were being compelled to return to conditions uh, in which they were gonna be rendered vul uh, vulnerable. All of these legal claims have failed thus far. So asylum claims, right, have not been uh, legitimized in the courts and, um, and folks have not sought systematic um, protection who have applied for it. And this is in part because of gaps in the current projection, protection regime as we understand it. So most importantly, there are no international legal instruments that directly address displacement of people, especially those who cross borders due to climate related harms. Um, it's particularly hard to classify people as a refugee as well, according to the 1951 Refugee Convention, because the term refugee itself is a legal term of art. So on the current international protection regime, there is no such thing as a climate refugee, and it is currently challenging to qualify as such. Uh, that's in part because according to the convention, you have to show that you have a well-founded fear of persecution and for reasons of your belonging to a particular race, religion, political opinion, uh, nationality, or membership in some social group. So you can only advance claims to protection according to the Refugee Convention um, when you are being persecuted as such, and also when you've already found yourself in another state. So you're already having been displaced across some border. You've already fled, right? So the convention, sometimes this is misunderstood, is based on this principle of non refoulement So the normative principle that underlies the Refugee Convention is that you can't send people back into harm's way. And why this is problematic as a potential framework for at least so far for climate refugee claims is that one, it's hard to prove persecution in the context of climate related movement, given the jurisprudential understanding of it. So it's hard to show that harm is due specifically to climate change and how that would amount to persecution by way of your membership in an identity group. Um, in fact, uh, sort of paradoxically, folks that are fleeing uninhabitable spaces, their state may not be failing in the sense of um, not offering them protections because of a form of persecution, but in fact that they're just not able to. So people might be rendered de facto stateless. And the sort of irony in this is that they might be fleeing to states who possibly could be construed as the persecutors, given that the developed world is in part, you know, largely responsible for anthropogenic climate change. And so this is one example, right, where this framework is hard to apply. Uh, furthermore, superior courts have been ruling that this doesn't even cover victims of natural disasters because they kind of reduce uh, the claims here to economic claims, right? Trying to look for a better way of, of life, um, which doesn't count. Um, and again, you need to claim asylum according to the Refugee Convention uh, based on having crossed an international border. But a lot of climate displacement might amount to a preemptive claim to movement, meaning wanting to claim protection before one is displaced. And so these present um, some complications. I wanted to specifically bring attention to the uh, sort of famous first climate refugee legal case. I don't wanna to spend too much time on it, but 
Uh, this decision arose out of the case of Yuwani Tisioda, who is from Kiribati in the South Pacific, who overstayed his visa in uh, work visa in New Zealand and wanted to claim being able to not be sent back on the grounds that he should be understood as a climate refugee along the lines that we've been talking about. But the courts ruled that um, despite the fact that he's at risk and that his, the island nation of Kiribati is subject to environmental harms, um, there couldn't be any grounds coming from the refugee convention for the for the reasons that I that I stated. Um, that being said, most recently, uh, he appealed to the UN um, Human Rights Committee, and they did find that while there was no violation of any rights from New Zealand denying him and you know deporting him and denying him protection, uh, the committee did want to recognize that the effects of climate change expose people to life-threatening risks. So we're seeing a move on the international protection regime to at least want to recognize climate-related displacement. Um, the Sydney Declaration of Principles on the Protection of Persons Displaced by Sea Level Rise has kind of shown this in 2018, um, which has said that while it doesn't amount to persecution, maybe the Refugee Convention can provide a context which forms of harm uh, that are engaged with the climate displacement context, uh, we could find protection in the international uh, regime, possibly from the Refugee Convention. Um, but there is this limit within international human rights law, as well as the current existing refugee uh, protection regime. Um, and a lot of this has to do with also identifying the degrees of imminence of harm. So uh, it's difficult to show to what extent uh, we're understanding harm in the human rights context, um, especially in the case of slow onset events where the harm threshold, it's unclear where it's met. Uh, and again, I can mention a little bit more about these in detail um, when we start talking about policy, possibly more in the Q&A. But in light of these gaps, so this conceptual challenge and these legal challenge, there is this normative challenge um, for grounding an account of justice for climate uh, refugees or climate displaced people as I'll be using it. So any normative framework that seeks to articulate the needs of the displaced have to account for this complex picture, right? So how we explain, conceptualize, and construct the problem will substantially shape our legal and policy interventions. So we need a normative framework that addresses vulnerability, but is not reduced to vulnerability, right? Speaks to adaptation and resilience. Um, and in light of that, I wanted to take up the challenge of whether or not there's a way to understand people's relationship to spaces that provides this more complex understanding of migration and movement with respect to climate change. And so what we'd want out of a normative account, which I aim to provide, is a substantive normative approach that can contend with this causal complexity, but which moves from a bottom-up approach. So doesn't try to generalize out from the experiences of people because context is important to some extent. But the challenge is, can we have a general principle of protection despite these various contexts? And we should be also able to address certain kinds of power dynamics that occur on the international level um, with regards to making decisions about what to do. Um, and in light of that, the normative framework then should be at least responsive to certain kinds of feasibility constraints and should at least be motivating to some extent for state action. So I'm gonna argue that I'm at least trying to uh, meet these lofty challenges of what a normative framework um, should be able to deliver on for uh, climate justice or justice for climate displaced people. So the aim of my project is answering this call, right? So I wanted to develop a normative framework that grounds policy and multilateral agreements that can, and the, the framework can identify the natures of our obligations to climate displaced people, can identify the duty bearers and the rights holders, and also has explanatory power in accounting for the moral wrong of displacement. And I want to do so in a way that, you know, resists this homogeneizing of context that's at play, um, but I also want to be able to give principled address, meaning that uh, these problems should not be addressed by the ad hoc decisions of states. So I'm going to move relatively quickly through the underlying um, practice space view I have so that I can set up really the content of the right that I see to ground it. 
But uh, so bear with me if this is a little fast, um, but I'll, I'll try to speak to, to some of these components here in the normative framework that I have. So I take a practice-based approach. Um, in philosophy, with regards to uh, obligations to climate displaced people, there's a pretty limited discussion. Um, there's probably about like 25 articles uh, so far on it, and there is increasing attention, which is great. Uh, and it comes at this sort of intersection of general political philosophy, some philosophy of immigration, and also hopefully now within a climate justice context. Um, but the certain you know, literature so far uh, potentially introduces grounding, uh, normative grounds that might be controversial or might fail to meet some of these feasibility constraints that I talked about. So some examples um, are Matthias Riese's uh, common ownership views, which takes a natural rights-based approach. Some folks take some group, group rights approaches. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about uh, other views here, but um, I can uh, sort of elaborate on how my view compares to them uh, in the Q&A. But I wanted to start um, from understanding our current practices. And in light of all these conceptual challenges, I wanted to see if there was a way to ground obligations to climate displaced people without relying on the need to identify either this you know, the truth of this complex causal chain of climate change prompting movement, um, and also wanting to start with a ground up approach that shows that the principles that emerge for protection arise out of our current practices, because the hope is that those would then be more motivating to drive certain kind of policy change and institutional change. So in light of that, I arrived on a, um, a social practice view or an associative view. Um, roughly what I mean by a social practice, and this is drawing from um, some of Aaron James' work on fairness and practice, um, and also harkens back to um, you know, Scanlonian views within the social contract uh, theories. But the idea is that a social practice um, coordinates actions between different agents um, around organizing around some sort of presumed shared ends. They don't necessarily have to be uh, endorsed by folks, uh, but that everyone sort of knows that those are the ends that are being organized around. And that organization proceeds by widely recognized social understandings. And so the way that we structure a certain social practice, its legitimacy is grounded in um, certain kinds of internal regulative principles that ensure that the distribution of how the practice or the organization of how the practice is, um, is justified in light of it always being able to achieve its basic aims. So it provides its own requirements for legitimacy. So I argue that we might understand the international state system as a social practice. And in light of that, we can understand why an obligation to protect climate displaced people emerges as an internal regulative principle. So I understand the state system um, as having this territorial nature. It's territorial all encompassing, meaning the entire surface of the earth is carved up into states. Um, and then it's territorially exclusive, meaning that it recognizes because of jurisdictional authority and sovereignty that each of these states can determine the policies and decisions, right, of the land that it carves up. So if you find yourself within a particular space, right, you're governed by, by the, the, the sovereign state, right, within which you find yourself. So that's sort of the organizational structure of the post-Westphalian system. So this was brought on, right, to replace uh, feudalist organizations of, um, of the globe. And it was a way to tie, uh, you know, sovereignty to territory to a specific extent to which that was going to enable some peace and stability. So here are the basic aims, right? Um, in order to, to reach a kind of more stable global order. Um, I also argue that some of the aims of the state practice understood, uh, understood in this way, and I'm, I'm pulling this from um, this kind of interpretation from the international relations literature, um, is that the state system is also there to protect certain basic rights um, given the way that it's organized. And so it's this decentralized organization and there are constraints on state's authority in light of being able to achieve those ends, but there's also certain kinds of presumptions of the rights states are afforded within the system, such as jurisdictional authority. Meaning, for example, states might have the right um, to choose who can or cannot be within their territories. 
So I talk about this right to exclude, which comes up in the conventional views in philosophy of immigration, um, where states in light of this social practice have this discretionary control over boundaries. Um, a key point though, where I then will show is normatively relevant, is this entire framework is assuming territorial stability, that these boundaries are gonna remain fixed, right? Because the assumption is that the conditions that allow that kind of geography, uh, that setup of geography are stable. And so this right to exclude uh, is allowed to be the case because every state is at least responsible for providing some place in which people can make claims on their basic needs and as far as basic rights and things like that, because everybody has a state of membership. There's at least some place where you have birthright citizenship. And so there is no real moral problem in being able for a state to claim its right to exclude insofar as everyone at least has somewhere where they're allowed to be within the state system. So these exclusionary immigration practices are basically conditionally justified based on the aims of the practice. Now, I argue in another paper that the sort of solution that allows this moral problem of exclusion to keep the state system legitimate is that idea of birthright citizenship, right? So it secures uh, everyone someplace where they can lay a claim. Um, but like I said, all of this is assuming a particular territorial conception. And when we change these empirical assumptions uh, to climate instability and territorial instability, the kind of idea of a birthright citizenship um, ensuring this guard against exclusion actually falls away. And so what I argue is that we actually need to assume new empirical conditions when we understand the social practice of the state system. And in doing so, we realize that when the old empirical assumptions fall away, it's not so much birthright citizenship that was important, but rather that it was protecting and guarding a particular right that was otherwise not transparent or uh, revealed because it was masked by the kind of work that birthright citizenship is doing. And so what I argue is in conditions of climate instability, the problem of exclusion is going to persist and the state system will remain illegitimate insofar as this particular right is not met. So even when citizenship claims, when people can maintain certain kinds of citizenship, they still may be rendered vulnerable where the basic aims of the system of protecting certain basic rights are not met. This is because in part, because all people are born somewhere, they're born within some sort of state territory. We're all embodied, right? We have to take up some sort of physical space. We have to exist somewhere right on the surface of the earth, which happens to be carved up into states. Once you can no longer assume that the territory that you're literally on um, may be able to be maintained in any kind of relevant way for habitability, there may be the case that if every state exercises its right to exclude, you are left with nowhere to be in a very you know, literal and existential sense. And so I say that when you switch to understanding this assumption of territorial instability, this right emerges from the practice that we otherwise may not have noticed, where there is a certain basic right, the right to a livable locality that the state system has to guarantee in order to maintain the legitimacy of its organizational structure. So what matters hasn't necessarily been citizenship, but the guarantee it provides, and that guarantee is this guarantee of the right. So I'm going to develop in the rest of the talk how I understand the conception of livability at play in the right, but I do want to talk briefly about how I understand the structure of the right. So I want to make a, a distinction for clarity. Um, when people talk in the human rights literature, there's sort of a distinction between practitioners that are working in human rights and sort of philosophical conceptions of human rights. So when people talk about human rights as a practitioner, often what they mean by uh, a right is that it's something that's very important, right? That's at stake, that's at risk. Uh, and it's something that then should be weighed or is weighty um, when we think about it and take it into consideration, weighing it against other important considerations. The difference where a philosophical conception and what I'm assuming uh, makes or it's a refinement on that is Rights uh, so, such as these, this basic right that I'm identifying are more than something that's very important that needs to be taken under consideration. 
but in, it connotes a set of very important interests that warrant protection. It also establishes sets of protections that would be feasible, right? That can be put in place and serve as the basis for protection mechanisms. Uh, so by placing constraints on states, for example, and that those constraints would be, according to the normative view, morally tolerable, right? That the institutions should do it, they should respect it, it should find some sort of institutional expression. So that's the way I'm understanding this uh, right. In particular, I'm understanding at, as a basic right in the way that Henry Hsu understood and articulated basic rights. Just to give you two seconds of a background, uh, Hsu came in uh, and made an intervention in this Cold War debate. Uh, especially with U.S. Uh, foreign policy that was privileging political human rights um, or political associations as the primary driver of human rights policy. And Shu came in, right, and said, hey, that's a mistake. There are certain rights that are more fundamental, that are more basic and essential, that ground, right, these other kinds of political rights. They're necessary for the existence of other rights. So that's that truly fundamental underpinning of a basic right. So as Shu argues, you know, nothing will turn out to be necessary for the enjoyment of any right unless it is also necessary for the enjoyment of every right and is pre precisely for this reason qualified to be the substance of a basic right. So that is the spirit in which I'm understanding the right to a livable locality. Uh, finally, because this is emerging out of a practice-based framework, the claim to a right to a livable locality is an associative one, meaning the correlative obligations to it are associative in nature. And when we advance arguments to protection, we're advancing them on the state system as a whole. So to fail to protect this right would be a um, failure of a legitimacy con condition that the state system has to meet. So if we want to divide the world up in the way that we do, and we want to distribute sovereignty in the way that it is, this right better be protected. So the state system is legitimate only to the extent that it protects this particular, well, in other conditions too, but in respect to climate displacement, that it protects this fundamental right from being violated. So when the right to a livable locality is violated, and states continue to exercise their sovereignty rights and refuse the provision of livable space for displaced people, a displaced person, a climate displaced person has lost an effective guarantee to certain conditions, including environmental, where their relationship to um, the territorial state system is essential. So traditional means of addressing certain kinds of failures um, that arise out of exclusion can no longer be withstood unless this right is protected. So for example, when this right is violated, you cannot claim certain kinds of political rights that might be enabled by citizenship, right? For example, if your you know, land that you're on is literally being submerged underwater or you know, desertification is such that you can't persist there anymore. So when livable spaces can no longer be guaranteed, your own even claims to the rights afforded by citizenship may become practically ineffective as a safeguard against exclusion. And so for this reason, I understand the protection of the right to a livable locality, not as having a humanitarian basis, not arising because there's just a sort of, uh, you know, a particular kind of humanitarian violation that's occurred. Uh, so therefore, when states act to address displacement, they're not acting as a matter of charity. Rather, in acting and satisfying the obligation, they're fulfilling a condition that even affords them the rights of state sovereignty to make decisions about their own immigration practices and things like that. Um, and so that's the operative conception of livability um, that I am defending. And this helps to sort of explain, and this is the explanatory force of the view, how I understand the moral problem of displacement. So I understand climate-related displacement as a foreseeable failure of the state system. So given its organizational structure, right, the risk of this kind of um, exclusion and violation is predictable. Um, in some sense, the conditions of displacement are even imposed on those who have been impacted because there's been this shift in the climate niche, right, where we're currently habitable spaces are no longer. Um, and there hasn't been an accommodation, right, to enable people access to that moving climate niche. So this lends, I think, support to the claims that President 
Tong of Kiribati, who is also a climate activist, um, has regarded where he says that um, as climate displaced people, they want to be given as a matter of right something that is deserved because it's uh, they've taken away what we have. So this is kind of grounding the idea that displacement um, is not sort of this matter of circumstance or sort of natural phenomena. It arises out of um, this particular political organization. And, and for that reason, I argue, we have principled address that comes from our current practice. And so that principle of protection, right, can be understood that given a state system, one that is understood as territory exclusive and territorially all encompassing, um, when we're understanding that as a social practice, each person has the moral right to be somewhere livable. So let me recap before I get into a little bit of livability. Um, I believe I still have about 20 minutes, right? Uh, are we, I'm just trying to keep an eye on the time. Yeah, yeah, 20 okay. minutes. Perfect, okay. So where have we been? Where are we going? Um, basically climate migration, as I've described and articulated, is primarily thought to raise this question of who should be entitled to protection as a refugee. But this standard framing is much too narrow, too conservative, in the sense that it takes too much of the existing international practices for granted. So the moral interest of climate migration doesn't actually begin once people become the equivalent of refugees, um, whether or not the international state system recognizes them as such. Rather, on the contrary, long before people find themselves in those unfortunate conditions of displacement, there's the potential for this right to already have been violated or they're already to be a, mor a moral failure of the state system, right? And that moral failure is predictable. So if you want to have the privileges of sovereignty, if you want the membership rights that are afforded to you as a state being part of the state system, you have to make institutional provisions for the continuous protection of this right to livable locality. Uh, this means that, uh, like I mentioned, climate place based displacement is not just some natural fact or circumstance that emerges in the world because of climate change alone, but that despite the involvement of weather and climate systems, both slow and quick onset effects, um, these conditions of precarity are in place because of the way the state system is arranged. So displacement is indeed both structural and political in this sense. Uh, and therefore the protection of this right should not be solely resting on any one given state's ad hoc decisions for protection, but rather that the structural and political nature of the wrong of displacement requires systematic principled address. Um, so how does that proceed? Um, I think that for the uh, kind of remaining of the talk, I want to flush out a little bit about what I mean um, in terms of livability, sort of the, the, the philosophical conception that's underlying uh, this right uh, that I just described uh, the structure to be. And so what I'm going to argue is that we should understand the right to be somewhere livable as what I call a relational functioning. And I am using functioning um, drawing from resources from the capabilities approach, but I'll show where I kind of make a unique tweak uh, to capabilities uh, literature. Okay, so the question of climate displacement, I think actually belies a sort of uh, underlying grounding, a normative question um, where, or a larger kind of question at play about the normative significance of people's relationship to place and what it means to be spatially located in the territorial state system in a normative way. Um, and I think that these considerations are obviously pressing given the shifting human climate niche. So I'll recommend you to read um, an article recently in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that's offering um, specific empirical predictions about what that shifting climate niche is gonna look like over the next 50 years. Uh, if you're like me and don't like sleeping, it's the kind of literature you wanna be reading um, to sort of understand the possible empirical conditions that we're gonna find ourselves in. Um, but the uptake from that, right, is that some places will be more accessible while others will be rendered uninhabitable. So I do wanna resist sort of alarmist tones, but do wanna address that this relationship of people in place is morally significant in light of these changing conditions. So I think that this then has a demand, right, on a normative framework for flushing out livability or habitability. So what is the normative relevance of being within a climate niche? 
for human beings at least. Um, and I think that this view goes beyond seeing the significance of securing certain basic resources. And I use the capabilities approach um, to ground that. So I think any account of the kind that I'm trying to argue for with this framework has to explain more specifically what people uh, um, at risk of displacement have a claim and a right to. And so this paper that I'm focusing on uh, provides this conception of the basic right to a livable locality, which gives the contours of the right, develops the content of the claim, and establishes what that right amounts to and that that's distinctive. And in order to do this, the paper raises and then addresses this underlying question that I, that I talked about that's a little bit more fundamental, which is, what is an embodied individual and community's relationship to space in a territorial state system that if the qualities of that physical location change, that space is still livable? So I think these questions can kind of, um, that I have here on the slide, uh, speak to different ways that you can formulate the challenge of climate displacement. So what do folks have a claim to? Well, that requires you to understand the content right of that claim. And in order to understand the content of that claim, we need to understand this sort of uh, normative uptake of this embodied uh, sort of relationship to space. Um, so my central argument, right, then for the livability conception is that livability, understood as a relational functioning, can account for two very important features of this relationship to space. That it's a constitutive way of being a human being in the state system, and it's also addressing the dynamical nature of our relationship to space within the state system. And this conception of livability addresses relevant normative relationships between people and place that grounds our obligations of protection to climate displacement. Um, so I do want to speak briefly. Uh, I won't go into them too much, but I start the paper actually with testimony of displaced people from um, different parts of the world. I drew this testimony out of um, a document called Moving Stories, which was published by Climate Outreach and Information Network. Uh, eventually, if I had the capacity to do some ethnographic work, this is something that I'd be interested in, in embellishing. Um, but this report had uh, collected testimonies from people around the world who's been affected both by slow and rapid onset climate events. And it, I think in going through them, I wanted to demonstrate that there's a diversity in, of course, geographic locations, in the environmental, social, and political conditions that people are in. And it demonstrates when you look at people's testimony, the complexity and variation of how displacement is experienced. So I wanted to be attentive to context, while at the same time, without homogeneizing this experience, be able to show that we can have a sort of principled account that can address what we ought to do in terms of protecting people from these places. Um, and so I'll go briefly through several of the quotes to kind of pull out the sort of philosophical content that I think is relevant um, that they're speaking to in this testimony. So in this first quote, which is by an unnamed survivor who was um, interviewed in the Indus River Basin in Pakistan after the 2010 floods, um, they said that the water came at night. We didn't have time to save our belongings. We had to choose whether to save our children and ourselves or our property and assets. So we chose to save our kids. We left everything and ran for our lives. And so, especially in the case of quick onset events, right, where you see this emergency flight, even in cases where certain resources or forms of property might be transportable, sometimes displacement may amount to a complete or significant loss of material assets. So the one kind of loss, right, that I think is being articulated here, you know, speaks to this idea of material assets being lost, but in light of the fact that, right, it's, it's a matter of life versus um, being able to, to secure these, these kinds of assets. And this can actually have long-term consequences for adaptability, right, because it's going to contribute to existing vulnerabilities people have when they don't have then the resources to maybe rebuild or return. Um, moving quickly, I just I want to be able to get to each of these quotes briefly, but um, so Octavio Rodriguez um, in Colombia was interviewed and had said that rains recently have been very intense, very intense, without comparison, like nothing seen before. Years ago, the rainy season lasted two months, November and December, and the water levels reached 20 to 30 centimeters. Now, in the last six to seven months, they've reached over two meters. We've never seen this before. We don't want to leave our land 
Here our past, our memories, our ancestors. We don't want to move to other parts. We don't know what to do there. We would return or we would turn into delinquents. We'd enter into a cycle of poverty, which happens in the cities. And so as Rodriguez's testimony reveals, climate-induced displacement threatens to deprive people of this connection uh, to a meaningful geography that's where identity formation has occurred or might be integral to the experiences of relationships that allow for this common history to be created. Um, also, I want to point that Rodriguez speaks to a type of epistemic deprivation that comes with such displacement and the knowledge that's tied to the experiences in place. So I think that that introduces a particular condition of precarity that comes with displacement that needs to be noted, that in addition to losing material goods or property, right, individuals or even whole communities lose the very infrastructural conditions that allow for knowledge creation and transition um, that's important for meaning, livelihood, and even the possibility, right, for adaptation and resilience. Um, drawing from another just brief quote, um, from an indigenous um, member, Allison Anasaluk in um, Alaska, uh, who was interviewed and uh, was responding that if we move, right, it won't be the same because it wouldn't be the same Shishmaref that everyone knows. And so she was speaking to having to be displaced, right, but the community being moved together. And for many, this is the conditions, right, for um, many indigenous people, at least um, in North America, particularly in the United States, this uh, forms of deprivation associated with climate displacement are also occurring within the larger context of colonialism and the territorial dispossession that had compelled resettlement away from tribal homelands and has disrupted practices of mobility. So those historic cases of displacement are now intersecting, right, with displacement caused by climate change. Kyle White has talked a lot about this, right, in terms of this being a new form of climate colonialism. And so in addition to the losses of material resources or certain important localities for identity and history, you're also seeing people that are uh, impacted because they are put in conditions of epistemic deprivation, right, that hinder their adaptive capacities. That has been sort of a, a product of colonialism in general, and now this kind of new form um, where it can be seen as a form of climate colonialism. And those who have experienced such, such deprivation, um, right, are vulnerable to these compounding um, losses and instabilities. And uh, finally, I wanted to make mention of, whoops, um, oh. Uh, this final quote uh, by Mohammed Rashid in Bangladesh, where he mentioned that the land here used to be a kilometer out to sea. We lost mosques, schools, shops, and farms. We are scared of the sea now. Gradually, it comes closer to our homes. When we sleep, we are scared. Every year, the tide rises more and comes in further. Next year, the village may not exist. So even in the case of incremental loss, right, of physical infrastructures and institutions, we're seeing conditions where a locality is becoming unlivable or to the extent in which livability is understood as this threshold. So the loss of certain spaces amount to a loss of relationships, particularly to this interdependence um, that is required of us as embodied beings in how we are relating to the spaces that we occupy. And um, I wanna kind of put a point on this by understanding that all of these sort of deprivations involved with displacement speak to, um, I think, uh, the variety in which they can be seen um, speaks to a sort of similarity in how, uh, in this particular phenomenological point that I, that I wanna make. So these are some of the deprivations that I just um, summarized in, in addressing the quotes. Uh, but where I see that there can be some sort of commonality drawn between them is in the way that I understand us being in space as a relational functioning. So how do I understand this? Well, I want to understand us being in a livable space um, where being is sort of understood as doing. <laughs> so what do I mean by that? Um, I'm, so I'm drawing from Butler and some other folks that are working in phenomenology where uh, they understand that physical spaces are not merely supports for action, right? They're part of the action of exercising particular kinds of rights um, and actions of the human body itself. 
So Butler accounts for these kinds of fundamental relationships. Um, she argues that for the body to move, it must usually have a surface of some kind, right? It must have at its disposal whatever technical supports allow for movement to take place. So the pavement, the street, they're all ready to be understood as requirements of the body as it exercises its rights of mobility, right? So it's, it's integral to the exercise of the right to move. They themselves become part of the action and not only its support. So this is speaking to sort of the, the relational way in which infrastructure and the environmental conditions we're in, right, has this kind of um, constant interaction uh, with our, our decisions and our choices. So as the testimonies that I just spoke to um, reveal, the body is not isolated from conditions that support it. And such con infrastructural conditions are also further created as bodily activities shape them. So if we understand the body as defined by the relations that make its own life and action worth possible, which is something that Butler argues, then a reasonable belief in the security of certain infrastructure or access to particular spaces is part of a legitimate expectation that your life can be sustained. Uh, and it may be understood as potentially a belief in the possibility that one's lived experience can continue right as an embodied subject. Um, why is this relevant for the context of the state system? What do I mean as being as doing? They're being as doing in this way. Okay, so if we understand being this way of being as this kind of constant action or doing, uh, it's not that we're like constantly keeping busy right in spaces, but it's that we're constantly acting and adapting in an environment and that environment affords our actions, just like a surface of the street affords walking. But as much as the actions being chosen are given the opportunity to be taken up. So the being of a person is in this ongoing relationship between choice to act right and the circumstances that allow for that choice to be made always tied into a specific determinate location, given that we're embodied. So being as a livable in a livable space, I think can be understood as what I'm calling this relational functioning that describes this kind of phenomena. I'm not just existing in a place that given its livability, its resources gives me the opportunities to live. If I'm alive, right, or conscious at all, um, it, to some extent that, you know, I'm always already living in a space functioning better or worse, depending on what that space affords me, the kinds of actions and choices it affords me. So if my homeland is sinking, for example, it's not going to afford what it has before for very long with regards to certain kinds of um, functionings, right? So as I understand it, one is in an interdependent relationship of adaptation and action within the environment that affords one's actions just as much as it affords the circumstances to choose to act. So being in a livable locality is being able to be in this continuous relationship between choices for action and the circumstances that affords such choices in a determinate space. So the right to it, right, is a right to this particular kind of relation. Where am I drawing from the capabilities approach? I don't wanna get mired in like, too much capabilities debate, but I do think there are some resources that are available to help us understand it. Um, so roughly, um, I am using the term functioning, but in a sort of unique way that uh, the capabilities approach doesn't necessarily do. So just traditionally, uh, the capabilities approach differentiates between instrumentally valuable elements for well-being, like material resources, and then these intrinsically valuable elements, namely capabilities and functionings. So functionings are understood as the activities human beings can achieve, certain states they can achieve that are constitutive of their being. Um, and so regardless of their social circumstances, you have to have this certain range of functionings. So livability is understood in that constitutive way. Uh, also on the capabilities approach, they distinguish between functionings and capabilities. There's different interpretations, but roughly capabilities are these opportunities, right? These freedoms to achieve certain functionings. Uh, capabilities, just put simply, are what people are able to do, um, but functionings are understood as like the related achievement of what they're doing. Um, so uh, you might understand these things as distinct. Most of the capabilities literature does. Um, an important component, too, of the capabilities approach is it shows that there's significance beyond just focusing on the provision of resources. 
Um, so for example, it talks about conversion factors. Um, and this uh, conception within the capabilities approach means that there are certain personal, socio-cultural and environmental factors, including you know, geography, as well as the built environment that facilitate the conversion of resources into these capabilities and functionings. So for example, um, you might have access to the resource of fresh water, but if the built environment or you don't have the means to um, you know, find that fresh water to be able to buy it, right, and are able to consume it, you may suffer from being deprived of a particular functioning, right, of being healthy because you don't have access to that water. So regardless of the availability of the resource, if these certain conversion factors aren't in place, the access to the resource doesn't satisfy, right, this certain way of being. And that's what I think is really helpful out of the capabilities approach that I borrow for my account, which is this idea that we need to look beyond resources and understand um, that embedded within this kind of relationship that we have to space is also including needing to observe the conversion factors, right, that help to characterize how we relate to space. So what do I mean by a relational functioning? Why is it a little different than how capabilities understands functioning? Because of my phenomenological understanding of being is doing, I actually don't think you need to distinguish between merely the opportunities for choice and the achieved functionings, right, of action, because what the environment is that you're in, right, the context of a livable space is constantly allowing, right, that action of making a choice and taking the action. So one is in this interdependent relationship constantly of adaptation and action within the environment that affords those actions just as much as it affords the choice to act. So I'm just repeating what I had said before. So being in a livable locality is one of continuing to be in a relationship between choices for action and the circumstances that affords such choices in the determinant space. So just to, to repeat that thing. Okay, so for the sake of time, um, I do want to briefly mention um, why I think there's some advantages of this normative approach, and then in the q and I can apply it a bit to some um, potential proposals that have been on the table in terms of policy. But I think um, what's helpful with integrating uh, and situating a capability approach or the resources from capabilities within the normative framework of a practice-based view is that we're not just focusing on means and resources alone, right? And that would fail to account for the diversity and the complexity and the context that is occurring in, in climate displacement, right? So we want to be particular to some extent to, to context. And so the capabilities approach directs us to look at like conversion factors, for example, which help to illuminate those contexts. Um, furthermore, I think that functioning of being in a livable space, why does it have a grip in terms of being a legitimacy condition for the state system? Well, and why is it so then a condition to restrict state action? By being able to live within a human climate niche uh, within a territorially based system, right, being able to, to occupy that kind of space ensures the satisfaction of certain aims of the practice, primarily being able to secure certain kinds of basic rights, right, because that satisfaction is needed to even advance claims to political rights and things like that. So the functioning of being in a livable space amounts to being morally relevant for the same st for the state system and being able to live within the human climate niche for that reason and to live within environmental conditions that enable opportunities to pursue the various capabilities that are afforded by membership and participation in the state system, right? So we may understand livability as this primarily secured relational functioning that then allows all these other sets of, of actions and choices of how you wanna live your life that you should be guaranteed within the state system. Um, I think that this view can sort of also highlight why migration in particular, or movement away from unlivable spaces should not near, merely be seen as a failure, but actually should be seen as an adaptive strategy. So the notion of livability that I have aims to capture this sort of embodied relational element, right, of a person existing within the state system. So it pays attention to resources, but it's not merely this instrumental need of resources. It's talking this constitutive or instrumental value or um, intrinsic value of how we are existing within the practice. And what's significant about that is that um, 
when we're understanding the context of climate displacement, we're understanding that there's a loss, right, of these livable localities that's amounting to a loss of conditions of being that are morally relevant, right, that have otherwise previously obtained in the state system. So conditions, or at least have been, had the potential to be guaranteed. So the conditions of displacement are in some sense imposed, right, on people when this claim to protection is not met. So given the state system's organizational structure and the unstable effects of climate change, and you know, we need to be able to satisfy this principle. Otherwise there's this imposition, right? Where that relational uh, element is no longer preserved. And I think that this can help redirect our focus to adaptation and resilience in part because the obligation to protect a right to a livable locality could amount to just taking people in, right? In terms of the cross-border movement that it often only gets focused as, but it also may amount to including uh, certain kinds of facilitation of adaptation to different spaces, as well as making changes to spaces to allow people to adapt. What I'm basically saying is I don't think the question of climate displacement should merely be reduced to this question of acceptance or refusal, right, for state borders, that the obligation might actually get states on the hook to provide or, you know, have certain kinds of provisions to make certain spaces where people already are more stable, or in the case where people have to move, to pay particular attention to context that allow those spaces to actually meet a livability threshold. So not merely just relocating people into like a refugee camp, for example, where they're deprived of certain kind of sovereignty and things like that. So I think that this can ground a principled uh, protection that doesn't require an individual right state's decisions, but rather everyone is on the hook in virtue of their participation in the state practice. Um, and so I can talk about the kinds of uh, policies that I've seen proposed that I think might um, be evaluated on this normative framework and we can have a discussion to what extent um, the obligation would be satisfied by these particular policies. Um, but I, I do wanna end with, um, with saying that I, I hope that this livability framework prompts us to consider how the facilitation of adaptation is not just merely limited to uh, ameliorative immigration policies alone, right? So an obligation to secure the right to a livable locality also involves the matter of how spaces themselves may need to adapt and how we might have to you know, make them adaptable uh, in terms of the interests of communities under particular environmental conditions. So an obligation to secure the right to a livable locality also involves the matter of how spaces themselves right, adapt to these interests. And the account that I've put forward um, hopefully tries to establish this expectation um, that the requirements for that kind of facilitated adaptation fall on the state system as a whole, as a constraint, as a legitimacy con condition. Uh, so we don't need to find any kind of right in pre-state conditions. We can just look at our current institutions and see that this arises out of them, in which case the hope is that um, they could be potentially more motivating uh, in that states can understand that their very sovereignty rights are conditioned on this right uh, being protected. So um, I will end there with uh, the presentation. And like I said, um, as we move into questions, I can talk about some practical applications, looking at some of these uh, policy and institutional addresses, and also just talk about some current events um, that relate to some of these issues. But I will stop there for the sake of uh, taking questions. Well, thanks so much.